Is North Korea's saber rattling gaining dangerous momentum? Among intensified weapons testing and officially ending its policy of reunification, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un says he will not start a war, but won't shy away from one either. And with increased cooperation with Russia on the table, could an emboldened Pyongyang prove ever more menacing? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is North Korea. North Korea has long been considered an unpredictable nation. Some even regard the so-called Hermit Kingdom as a potential ground zero for nuclear war. For Western powers, engaging effectively with Pyongyang has proven elusive for decades. In 2018, hope that the first ever meeting between an American and North Korean leader would change that reality left everyone disappointed. Fast forward to today and the North's increased weapons testing, including of an underwater nuclear system, has many in the region and the world on edge. Here's a look. North Korea recently announced it tested the underwater nuclear weapons system Hyil off the southern end of the peninsula. The test took place hot on the heels of US officials' call for creating international dialogue with Pyongyang. We are prepared to meet the DPRK without any preconditions to discuss any and all issues of mutual concern. Unfortunately, the DPRK continues to reject offers of dialogue. North Korea argues the test was a direct response to naval exercises by the United States, South Korea and Japan, which it considers to be an act seriously threatening the security of the DPRK. On the other hand, US-led military exercises are said to be carried out to counter any threat that might come by way of North Korea. That has to do with Kim Jong-un instructing his munitions industry in the nuclear weapons sector to rev up. He had already announced his country no longer seeks reunification with South Korea. Last month saw increased military activity on the North's behalf, including firing hundreds of artillery rounds into the water by the border shared with its neighbour. That, coupled with the testing of a hypersonic glide vehicle with alleged ballistic missiles, worry analysts. They say Pyongyang is going further with its rejection of dialogue, but add it all to be an ideological adjustment for regime survival. There are citizens who are not happy with the management. Officials recorded 196 defectors entering South Korea last year. Ten of them are reportedly among the North Korea elite. That's the highest number of defectors from this group since 2017. The last item on the list that worries the US is the busy diplomacy between Moscow and Pyongyang. North Korea's foreign minister, Cho Son-hui, was at the Russian capital last week to establish closer cooperation between the two nations. President Vladimir Putin will be paying a visit to North Korea in return. Washington believes this dynamic to be a major security threat. The visit brought back allegations that North Korea is shipping artillery and missiles to be used against the Ukrainians, while the Russians are believed to be providing its ally with technology for developing military capability. US officials say this level of unprecedented cooperation could result in North Korea becoming an even bigger threat over the coming decade. So has the saber-rattling turned into something more dangerous? And why have Western diplomatic efforts failed so badly? Well, joining me now to debate that and more are from Washington, independent journalist and writer, Tim Shorrock. From Seoul, lecturer in international relations at Troy University, Daniel Pinkston. And from Beijing, political and economic affairs commentator, Einar Tangen. Thanks all so much for being with us. Daniel, I'll, I'll start with you. For so many years now, North Korea has just made global news headlines for its weapons testing. Each time they, they seem to be more sophisticated. But is this recent round of activity in this current global context more threatening or, or just more of the same? Well, I think currently around the peninsula, mutual deterrence is strong, it's robust. I think North Korea is deterred. They continue to work on their weapon systems. In North Korean politics, all political disputes are solved through organized violence, domestically and um, externally. 
So the thinking of the regime is to uh, increase its sources, its military uh, resources and capabilities, to stand up to any um, external threat. And uh, this is their worldview, and they continue to do this. And of course, at a great opportunity cost to their people. Okay, Tim, are you on the same page there? And do you think the West should be worried that you know the North is increasing cooperation, in particular with Russia, and that we you know Putin uh, will be coming to visit in person now? Or should it be expected that, especially since the U.S., South Korea, and Japan uh, are cooperating more militarily now too? Well, as somebody who's I've been following the U.S. and Korea for many years, and I think that the responsibility for the current tensions also re remains with the United States. I mean, since the uh, last attempt to have negotiated peace ended in 2019, uh, those talks between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, uh, there's been a steady escalation on the North Korean side in terms of the testing of missiles and other kinds of weaponry, as Daniel Dan just spoke of. But the United States has also uh, upped its, its uh, military exercises. And I think a lot of people have missed the significance of the U.S., Japan, South Korea military partnership, they call it, but it's really an alliance. And they've been, you know, since this was announced last August, uh, the U.S., South Korean, Japanese militaries have been, you know, taking part in, you know, at major exercises led by, you know, U.S. nuclear powered uh, aircraft carriers and, uh, you know, bombers. And I think that the U.S. also has a tendency to focus on militarism far more than diplomacy. And I think that, that you know, the tensions have ratcheted up. It's like tit for tat, military exercises on both sides that's really, you know, really brought it to a boiling point right now. And I think it's clear in South Korea that there's a lot of worry as well. Uh, but, you know, I read from even, you know, even in the progressive Korean press in South Korea, there's a lot of concern about what North Korea is doing but I think there's more of a recognition there uh, that, you know, uh, President Biden's policies uh, and this trilateral relationship and also the, you know, the U.S. use of and deploy deployment of strategic weapons uh, to South Korea, you know, ha has, has really uh, upset the apple cart, if you will, in, for, for North Korea. And I think, you know, that's where the kind of the turning point has been. And I think the question is, how do we de-escalate this? Right. But, uh, Tim, let me ask you, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I do see you as more of arguing the case that the West is the provocateur here, that it is usually Western powers cooperating with South Korea uh, that agitates North Korea in a way that's not really necessary. Um, you have been such a proponent of dialogue, and you were so optimistic back uh, during the Singapore summit between Trump and Kim Jong-un. So, I mean, that was at a time when things were supposed to be getting better. And yet, engaging in dialogue still didn't work. So what really has gone wrong? Is, is it always on the West to stop provocations? Well, first of all, I, dis I disagree with your use of the term West. I mean, I think this is a conflict between the US, South Korea, and Japan, and, and the North Korea. Yeah, with China I agree. I'm Russia sorry, I'm using West as far too general a term. Yeah. So, I mean, right. I, I, and, and so I think, you know, we have to focus on that. But, you know, yeah, yeah there was dialogue. In fact, you know, uh, as, as some people have pointed out in, in recent days, uh, some U.S. analysts, I mean, there was a period of time from 1990 until 2019 when the DPRK was, you know, trying to uh, you know, seeking in various ways to normalize relationships with the United States and, and, and you know, come to some kind of agreement and some kind of peace agreement uh, so, so they could move on and have north-south discussions. And that happened mm -hmm. for a while in that 2018 to 19 period. But, I mean, I think, you know, it's important to look at why those talks broke down. I mean, there was a there was an issue on the table. There was an offer on the table for by Kim to shut down some, you know, 80 percent of his nuclear facilities. Uh, Dan may know more about that than I do, but but the, the fact is that that was rejected because they also wanted 
to cut back on some of the sanctions that had been imposed. And so okay. the talks broke down and, you know, Trump walked out. So I think, you know, it's, it's if the U.S. is going to keep up the military pressure without any kind of, you know, in, it, it, the talks just won't go anywhere if the U.S. demands South North Korea, you know, surrender okay. first as a, as, a, as a precondition. I mean, Einar, do you agree there? And it is that to assume that North Korea really is just a very rational actor in all of this, and that oh. if you just could engage, these problems could be better solved? Well, I, I do agree uh, that uh, the U.S. likes to stir the pot and there is no end game. But the idea that uh, Kim is just this wonderful uh, uh, saint is is not uh, correct. That doesn't fly. Uh, he has his uh, national interests and models. And, and what I don't understand is, you know, we're talking about this uh, situation with this, uh, quote, underwater uh, nuclear device. I, it's not even clear. There's no readings that there's a lot more uh, radioactivity in the water beyond what Fukushima likes to throw in there every few days, a uh, few weeks. Uh, but, you know, look, he, he comes out and he says, um, the South is our enemy. I'm no longer looking for the uh, to reunify. And then, you know, a few days later, he talks about some uh, new, uh, you know, bomb that they have, et cetera. I think people have to step back a little bit and stop talking about all the things that could have been. <clears throat> uh, North Korea has not always been the best partner in these. Certainly, the U.S. was, uh, was really bad, especially during the uh, Clinton period when they, they seemed to have something. Uh, we were going to give them two light water uh, reactors uh, in exchange for reversing things. And then because of, you know, the... The Congress was controlled by the Republicans. They didn't want, uh, for whatever reason, they started adding sanctions, and that kind of uh, blew that off. Um, and then Trump was not there. But you know, let's let's look at this. Kim has actually what he's done is he's opted for the succession of his bloodline over the reunification of Korea. Mm. You know, you don't take your nine-year-old daughter to work if you're planning Armageddon, if you know what I mean. And uh, so, I mean, it's just. This should actually be looked at very positively. He's abandoned the most uh, difficult issue in the reunification of the Koreas, which is the Kims want to rule Korea, and there is no way that they're going to rule South Korea. Um, Japan, Korea, U.S. are not going to invade North Korea. Uh, it, it would be, you know, un unthinkable and yeah. very, very, very difficult. Yeah. So, so, so I mean, think... it, it, right right now, I think I'm somewhere in between these two in terms of saying the, the realistic thing is as North Korea always wanted a nuclear weapon. They have it and they're not going to give it up. And at this point, he's going to be looking to solidify his borders and perhaps try to, quote, normalize his uh, uh, country. Uh, he has a little bit of open space simply because he's now getting closer to Russia they didn't want to be depend totally on China, so this gives them some options. Hmm. It's interesting. I mean, you moved into the reunification issue. Um, uh, Daniel, I'll, I'll pick this up with you then. Because it's declaring South Korea an enemy state and, you know, not just banning reunification. Um, for decades now, Pyongyang has ingrained that reunification in its people and taught them how to prepare for it. I mean... How is this actually playing out in North Korea, if, if you can speak to this? You know, even uh, dismantling his father's reunification monument, it must be very confusing for people there. And you, you have to question then what is the, the domestic strategy in all of this as well? Can he play it both ways? Can, can he have, you know, the, the strongest strategy for his foreign policy and how to deal with what he sees as his foreign enemies, but also maneuver properly within the North Korean state to keep people in line, I guess? Well, I think his speech and conclusion at the plenary uh, meeting last month, which uh, you know included all of these uh, changes in strategy, the fundamental goals have not changed. So since the DPRK was established in 1948, the uh, objective has been to uh, complete the revolution and achieve the final victory. That's been um, static and steady, but the strategies have changed how to achieve that goal. So under his grandfather in 1950, it, uh, the use of force in the invasion of the South was the instrument that failed. And then from the mid-1950s until the late 80s, uh, till the end of the Cold War, the strategy was uh, subversion and undermining uh, South Korea and to trigger uh, a rebellion. Uh, 
a people's revolution in the South, that failed as well. Then with the end of the Cold War from 1990 until the, the present, um, a period of engagement um, and using uh, diplomacy and talks to try to achieve those same goals, which again was unifying uh, the Korean Peninsula on North Korean terms under the Kim party state, but that failed as well. So Kim Jong-un finally recognized that as failing at the plenary last month, and now they're building a new strategy. So I think um, Kim and the leadership recognize that, or they believe the world is undergoing this uh, change. There's a lot of instability and turbulence right now. Mm. So uh, the usual suspects like Russia, Iran, China, and North Korea, they're re aggrieved revisionist states wish to overturn the uh, liberal world order, order the post-World War II uh, order, which is based on um, the rule of law, peaceful settlement of disputes, human rights, open uh, market-based economies and institutions to support that. So they wish to overturn that. They don't have a good uh, plan or agreement on what the vision for the future should look like. Mm. Uh, but nevertheless, they want to overturn the status quo. So in a North Korean system, uh, the use of force is a legitimate instrument for settling political disputes, both domestically and internationally. So uh, this is how they deal with their, their problems, and okay. they think there's an opportunity now to move forward with that. I, I just have to come back to Einar quickly, because you looked exasperated listening to that analysis. Why so? <laughs> Well, yes, uh, it sounded like uh, the State Department was talking there. Uh, the, you know, the U.S. right now is not the country that can be talking about the rule of law, supporting international institutions, et cetera, or human rights. Uh, we can see that quite clearly uh, with Gaza. Um, this idea that somehow the U.S. is an angel in all of this is nonsense. Uh, the U.S. has its problems, its intransience. The fact that it cannot be relied on has become a major, major issue, and it's what could push a, uh, a nuclear arms race uh, throughout Asia. You know, you, you have Japan, they just uh, purchased 400 um, missiles, cruise missiles that are capable of carrying nukes. They're the only country that has the complete supply chain and the yellow, uh, the uh, fissionable material to make a, a, a nuclear weapon. And they could make many of them very, very quickly. If they do that, you know, everyone else is gonna be piling in. So right now, the U.S. is really the problem, and it's not just because uh, you know they they made a complete mashup of the North Korean situation, but because no one trusts us anymore. Okay, let let me bring Tim back into the conversation. Do you think uh, Kim Jong Un sees an opportunity here then among you know a sense of global destabilization? You know the war in Ukraine, Gaza, the Red Sea. Uh, is Kim Jong Un Kim Jong Un looking at all of this through that lens? Well, clearly, you know, he always looks at what's going on in the world, you know, Libya, Iraq, and so on. It's part of the reason that he developed his nuclear weapons system was what he saw what the U.S. did in, those, in Libya and Iraq. Uh, so, yeah, he's always monitoring the situation. Uh, but I do think that it's, in, it's you know, trying to explain why they might be doing what they're doing doesn't mean you're saying they're great people or good guys. It means that you're trying to understand the situation from their perspective, and and then and then try to you know my idea is like you know American negotiators, American diplomats, national security people need to look at that, and and I think that it's clear that they responded quite strongly to this U.S. Japan Korea alliance. I I really think that that's this has been de-emphasized, mm. particularly in in the U.S. media. But I mean, you know, this is the first time since the end of World but, War Tim, would II you that accept part the of Korea has been militarily linked. Yeah, would linked you accept the North argument with, though that Japan that the U.S., Japan, and South Korea are at a stage now where they believe they cannot be naive about this because Kim Jong Un in North Korea is again not a rational actor here. They need to take these defensive measures because you just don't know what he'll do. You can say you can try to understand where they're coming from, but most would argue they just don't make sense anyway. This is, not, again, not a rational actor. I, I, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I, I don't agree with that. I think that they are rational, as rational as the United States can be. I mean, I, I do think that, the, the, you know, they, they take measures 
and they use rhetoric that's just, you know, very inflammatory, you know, consistently. In terms of like South Korea, what, what Daniel was just talking about, the, you know, their unification policy, I mean, I think it's partly a recognition of the fact that South and North Korea have, <clears throat> excuse me, grown apart, you know, widely during the last, you know, 20, 30 years. And that even in South Korea, I was surprised when I was there last April to find, you know, talk to people who had been very active in the democratic movement during the 80s and so on, talking about not not pressing for unification anymore, but pressing for some kind of like, you know, free and open Korea where there wasn't foreign troops on one side or the other and Koreans could, you know, visit each other and, and have kind of joint economic projects and that kind mm. of thing, moving away from a unified country. So I think, you know, in, in some ways, you know, he, 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 he sees that, and but, but I mean, he's using this as a way you know, to drum up, you know, you know, military support from his own people. Mm. By, you yeah, know, I mean, he, a, many have a said that break with, with the past. he needs he needs the West as an enemy for domestic reasons. He needs South Korea at this point as an enemy as well for the rest of domestic reasons. He needs to create a heightened sense of fear among North Koreans, Koreans to take the control that he has. But, Tim, I'm just going to ask you quickly what you make of if, if you do think, again, Kim Jong-un can be negotiated with as, as just a fellow leader in a sense, what do you make of, you know, the human rights record on, on Korea and North Korea is especially right now. I mean, we just saw a video of two teenagers being punished in front of a crowd for listening to K-pop. It's hard to believe that there would be some common ground to be found with, with a nation that behaves in that manner. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't explain that kind that kind of you know dictatorial draconian policy of of, of execution and you know, imprisoning people for watching South Korean media. Uh, but I do think that the the, the constant war, uh, the pressure pressure of war, the this all, this forever conflict uh, does have a huge impact on human rights, both South and North. I mean, you know, South Korea was able to throw off its authoritarian regime, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, but, the, you know, the South Korean leaders also used, uh, you know, the, the threat, the threat from North Korea and the division, you know, to consolidate their dictatorship and to abuse human rights in the South. You know, that changed. I do think that a lifting of, you know, some kind of lifting of some kind of peace agreement you know, arms control, anything okay. to, to, to stop the spiral toward toward more and more violence on both sides. Okay, Daniel. Uh, or the threat of violence on both sides. Daniel, do you agree there at all? Well, I want to come back to the, the issue of collective security and security cooperation. Tim had mentioned the trilateral security cooperation with Japan, South Korea, and the U.S. Also, there are other sending states in the United Nations Command. Here, there's a multinational coalition here, states that supported South Korea during the um, Korean War. The deputy UNC commander here is Canadian. Uh, Canadians, Australians, British, and so forth uh, participate in the exercises here and would come to the assistance if war two were to uh, break out again in the armistice, after the armistice collapsed. So I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding about these collective security institutions among uh, democracies. Putin has the same misperception about NATO in uh, Europe. These are an aggregation of military resources, of course, but I would argue they don't have a uh, hostile intent towards North Korea. Without with an unprovoked status quo, the situation we have today, the, this coalition is not going to invade North Korea. That's not how democracies work. So if the prime minister of Canada, Australia, and so forth, if, in fact, the U.S. and or South Korea would act opportunistically, said, let's go to war against North Korea, let's go to war against North Korea, let's invade North Korea. If you think the domestic constituencies in Canada, Australia, Denmark, the U.K., France, et cetera, are going to support that, you have a fundamental misunderstanding of politics and how politics work, works in these countries. And um, okay. it's just not how it works. I know, so I can North give you... Korea is lucky that this multinational... I, 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 you know, D D David, I... I, I, I... I can't believe you say these things. I mean, you, we, the United States went into Iraq on a fabrication. We're talking about North do you Korea. deny no, that? About we went into uh, Afghanistan because we wanted to kill one guy. You know, you 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 pronounce these things, and it, it's just amazing. 
we're the ones who are undermining the WTO by refusing so, to allow judges to be appointed. And, and, you, and you sit so, there and do it. Now, I, I, I agree. So I don't US. think North Korea is an easy actor to deal with. But your, your idea that somehow there's this grand coalition of good guys out there, you know, we've been doing a lot of bad stuff. Over 90 different regime change operations, uh, 72 during the Cold War, 20 since, where we have gotten in going into democratic nations and trying to influence elections. We spend $90 billion on intelligence and uh, you know misinformation. Okay. So how do you square that with this good guy image you like to portray? All, all human all human organizations are flawed. Humanity is flawed. Oh, the Jesus. U.S. has flawed foreign Tell policy that to and the all dead of that. People. If, if, if the United States dropped into the ocean and no longer existed and was eliminated from the international system, suddenly North Korea is going to become this um, uh, humanitarian uh, shining uh, city that. on the hill. That's a false dichotomy. So it's just... It's just so if you if you okay. think if you think those countries in the UNC would support an unprovoked invasion of North Korea, I'm sorry, you're just mistaken. Unfortunately, just not gentlemen, I'm not saying that. I think <laughs> I'm saying that. I think it's important no, to look at the factions no within the. I think it's important to look at within the factions within the U.S. too. I mean, there are there have been always people in the U.S. power structure here in Washington calling for you know not necessarily an open invasion, but other ways to intervene in North Korea militarily and, and, and with intelligence and all kinds of ways, uh, you know, to subvert the, to subvert the North Korean there, regime. We own it. Yeah. It's a bankrupt country. Why would we go in there? Why, doesn't even make any sense whatsoever. I'm just saying they have an economy are, that's $28 there billion. Are, dollars. <laughs> okay. All I'm saying is that there are regime change, there are regime change advocates in the United States. Gentlemen. There's no doubt about that. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. That will have to be the final word because we are completely out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists sincerely so much for being with us. And our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on X and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.